So there's loads of different ways now for people to find out about restaurants. So that's not our remit anymore. Our remit really is to kind of say, of all the places in Victoria, we've whittled it down to the things, the places that we think are the best for this year. And here's, here's, our, here's our buffet, go and feast. After three years of disruptions, we all know why, the Age Good Food Guide has been released. It's pretty exciting. I've been working on the guide for ages. And our guest today is editor Rosalind Grundy, who has done a magnificent job of putting the, the MOOC together, the MOOC, the magazine slash book. Rosalind, welcome to Dirty Linen. Thanks, Danny. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you on the show. Uh, so tell us about this year's guide. Uh, what, what stands out for you? I think I didn't realise until the actual event uh, that what a generational change it's been. When we were putting it together and deciding on our lists of finalists in different categories because we give these annual awards for things like Restaurant of the Year, Chef of the Year, New Restaurant of the Year, et cetera, et cetera, um, I didn't realise when we were discussing our finalists and coming up with our winners that we really had such a a, um, a bunch of young winners this year, names that people perhaps won't have heard of in the past, not so many of the the stalwarts in on the winners' podium. And it just struck me what an amazing generational change it's been and what a a real sign of resilience for the industry. It was, yeah, it was quite, quite, you know, uh, an unconscious decision, series of decisions that led to that, but it really was quite, quite a standout feature of the awards night. Yeah, that's so interesting. And I hadn't really thought of that either, but it's, it's true. Um, I suppose some of the chefs that were, came up to the podium, Khan Nguyen, uh, whose restaurant Aru was named restaurant of the year, Ross Magne, uh, Sarah, new restaurant of the year, Julian Hills, chef of the year from Navi, I suppose has been around for a while, but to get that recognition is, yeah, quite extraordinary. We haven't seen him up there in that capacity before. Um, yeah, and I think something that also stood out for me during the whole process was regional restaurants and how much um, how they just seem to be some of the most exciting places to dine in the state. I mean, yeah, what stands out for you in terms of the regions? Well, that's another thing. We hadn't really done the analysis of the figures or anything, but there were more um, hatted restaurants and two restaurants with two hats in regions than we've ever had before. And I think it is true to say that some of our best dining in Victoria, and I think we'll see the same thing coming through in the New South Wales Good Food Guide, which will be released next week, that some of the best dining in the country is now in the regional areas, and that's that's never something that's really been a strong feature before. It's it's always been considered that the best eating is in the city, and maybe the regional places there are exceptions, but that they are, as a general rule, rung behind that. But that's not the case anymore, and it's it was very striking last night. Mm. So a lot of people love to know or be, would be interested to know how this book comes together. Can you give us a sense of the process behind the Good Food Guide? Okay. Mm, let me see if I can take it back to the start of the process. So so we, we start really with the list of the restaurants that we want to review and it might – it will start with kind of which ones we had in last year and we'll kind of filter those. Are they still performing? Are we still getting good feedback on them? Which places have closed since the last edition and so on and so on. So we come up with a, a basic list of our restaurants. We add on to it all the places that have opened in the meantime. I mean, even just since we put this guy into press, there have been a bunch of new openings and there will be an, another few more in the next few months. So we put together a, um, a prospective list of places that we want to review. Maybe there were some that we 
accidentally omitted last time or that hadn't um, performed previously and we want to put them back on the list. So, you know, we we put together this list. Um, We have a list of reviewers and we're always trying to recruit more talented reviewers, uh, as in not more talented but more talented (laughs) reviewers. No offence taken. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And we and I, well, this is what I have done, tried to match the restaurant's match the reviewer to the restaurant that I think that they will most like so that we can give the restaurant its best best shot at um, glory and finding its own audience. So I, I probably wouldn't send one of our more senior and older reviewers to a place with pumping loud music that's aimed at a, a young audience, that's not going to hit its market. So I try and match the reviewer to the place wherever possible. And if they've got a exceptional skills in French, why not send them to a French restaurant? Or if they've lived in Italy for many years, why not send them to Italian restaurants? And so on and so on. So we try and do our best job of um, sending people to, to the best match for them. And then they go to the review, they book anonymously under an assumed name, which is getting ever harder with um, booking services like Resi and that sort of thing. Um, I wish we could supply them all with burner phones or something like that so they could all make um, <laughs> make their review, make their bookings that way, but we can't do that. Um, and so wherever we can booking under an assumed name or perhaps their companion's name and they eat their meal. They try not to make too much of a song and dance about it and draw too much attention to themselves. They're just there to be a diner's representative, being the average diner, and they uh, choose the meal, choose the dishes that they think will best showcase the restaurant and probably not repeat too many of the dishes that were in the previous guide so that it's clear that they're eating um, fresh new things. And then they write they write their review, they file that to me, and we... And I edit it to, um, you know, make sure it's grammatically correct, factually correct, check check the dishes that they've mentioned against the menus and, you know, and so on and so on, that kind of editing process. We fact check all of the details probably too many times for some restaurants. They, You know, they get a few calls often to check factual details and then it goes off to designers. We try and get the most beautiful photos we can to make the restaurants look as gorgeous as they can and uh, it all kind of comes together in a, well, in this case, a magazine for the first time um, with hats and scores. Yeah, so we haven't had um, hats and scores for the the publications that were released during the throes of the pandemic. Um, Hats and scores are back this year, but there is a difference with the addition of hearts. Can you explain where the hearts fit in, what function they play? Well, we're trying to um, broaden out the types of restaurants that we consider worthy of bringing to readers' attention. Um, So not not just the very formal, starchy kind of places, but more informal, maybe some more um, neighbourhood restaurants, more casual restaurants, that sort of thing. Um, And we are giving them a heart symbol kind of to show we love them and that they are um, places that we as critics would cross town to visit or suggest that you cross town to visit um, and just show them a bit of love. So it's not just the kind of uh, more heavy-hitting end of the restaurant industry but some of the more casual neighbourhood places try and be a bit more inclusive and that's something that we're really going to um, emphasise in the guides that follow or I'm hoping that whoever takes over from me will um, will work on that side of things. Um, so <laughs> leaving aside the question of whether it's will be you or not, because there's still a year <laughs> to twist your arm. Um, so uh, what do you, what would you say to, to diners who look through the guide and say, oh, but my favourite restaurant's not there? <laughs> um, 
Well, I'll, I'd say two things. One is if if we have just genuinely overlooked your favourite restaurant, send me an email and let me know and we'll consider it for next time. Or maybe we did review it and we didn't think it was as good as you thought it was. Um, or we may not know about it. Or there's a whole lot of reasons why not every um place makes the cut and one of them is that we're limited to well we were limited this year to 128 pages and there are a bazillion restaurants in Victoria now and uh, it was just impossible to squeeze every one of them in and and uh, so we're I think what what the aim is really is not to say this is every restaurant in Victoria but these are some places that we think that you ought to know about and it's a snapshot of this year in eating and next year it's going to be a whole different list and maybe it's going to be amongst the, the places in next year's guide. Mm. Yeah, it is it is naturally going to happen if the guide broadens out its remit and covers a greater range of restaurants, then, of course, it will end up being less comprehensive. It's... Um, it's such it's such an interesting conundrum. Like it's um yeah, it, it can't be an encyclopedia. And I suppose in a way, like the guide's been around for forty years in Victoria, which is extraordinary. And it does do such a different job now to what it did, you know, pre internet, pre everything being on Google. Um, uh, yeah, it it it's it is more that snapshot, isn't it? Yeah, it's kind of a curated list, I guess you'd say. It's an, in the in the past, really. I think its purpose was to um, inform readers about places that they might not have heard of and w- w- might not be able to find out about in any other way. And now people have got so many different ways to find out about restaurants. You know, um, they're making their choices by. Insta or TikTok or whatever the kind of social media channel might be, or or Google or other other um, food media outlets. So there's loads of different ways now for people to find out about restaurants. So that's not our remit anymore. Our remit really is to kind of say of all the places in Victoria, we've whittled it down to the things, the places that we think are the best. For this year, and here's here's our here's our buffet. Go and feast. Yeah, nice. <laughs> Although there probably aren't that many buffet restaurants in the book. No, I mean, <laughs> I mean a virtual buffet of restaurants. What do you find most satisfying or enjoyable about um, the, bringing this book to life? Um, gosh, that's. Oh gosh, I don't. No one's ever asked me about that before. Um, I'm not sure what it is. It's probably. I think the thing I like mo- most is. Oh, gosh, <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm flummoxed by that one. Um, I think the editing process itself, in some ways, is what I like the most. It's that weird. I think, you know, just uh, that winnowing process, that winnowing of, of, the, of the many options down to the fewer options and trying to um, think about what is going to serve our readers the best is what I like. Yeah, that's really interesting. That sounds like a terrible answer, doesn't it? I just don't know. Oh, I don't think there's a, there's a wrong answer. I mean, you know, you, you're an editor – and yeah, it just sound, you love that curatorial process and that sort of yeah, the sharpening of the copy and the sharpening of the project overall. I and think. choosing beautiful images and 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 in in a way then rewarding the places that I think are exceptional and that our readers really deserve to know about. I mean, we at the awards night. I look around the room and it's just these incredibly talented, hardworking, resilient people who have survived so much over the last three years. I mean, we all have with whatever we've been doing over the last three years, but to see these people who have had survived so much and done it so hard in that room supporting each other, cheering each other, it was it was a beautiful moment. I mean, you don't 
do a guide like this for that moment, but really it was such a such a reward for such a lot of hard work from all of our team, really. I mean, you don't do it for that moment, but I suppose it does represent or it is like a distillation of the project of the guide and of the people that work on it, which is to celebrate restaurants and to express love for restaurants uh, and to, yeah, shine a light on what they do. Yeah, that's right. I feel a little bit emotional just thinking about about how um, supportive they all are of each other, just the kind of cheers that go up in the room when one of their peers is um, celebrated. I mean, sure, there are some people whose dreams are crushed and lie scattered on the floor, but <laughs> mostly what I hear in the room and I, and I only hear about the others later is um, the celebration and the, the joy of being rewarded, whether that be one hat or, you know, a restaurant being celebrated with their first hat ever or or going up to a second hat or even rarer, um, a third hat, Voodoo Monde, who's the, a restaurant that's been around for 22 years. It's always strived for the highest and hasn't always quite hit those heights. Um, was elevated from two hats to three, and it's been three before, but it's had, you know, some not so... Um, stellar years, and then it's back at the top of top of the top of its game with a, a young, very ambitious, very talented chef in Hugh Allen um, in the kitchen, and and to see uh, the 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 joy that that brought that team and the and the room really was a lovely moment. What's the process of awarding and and dropping hats um, behind the scenes? Um, it's a lot of soul searching and revisits to some of those places that we are considering um, dropping hats. It's it's a um, it's never satisfying. It's never fun to drop places. Um, drop hats from places. It's it's something that we really take very seriously and don't do lightly. And so we have a senior panel, um, and Danny, you were one of our senior panelists this year. Um, some of our most senior and most capable reviewers come together and very seriously mull over what they've heard about the restaurants, what feedback they've had about the the restaurants, what what the reviewer has scored it, what our experience of it is, and we all sort of consider all of the scores very seriously. And then, if any of them are losing a hat, for example, we will send someone back to revisit and have another discussion. We ended up, I think, having. Three meetings and countless emails um, about some of the places that we were considering either elevating but mostly dropping. Um, that's where the big serious discussions are had um, from hats this year. Yeah, it's um, it's not taken lightly, that's for sure. Um, so, I mean, you've been involved with the guide for ages um it's 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 changed the landscape's changed a lot of we, as we've spoken about and of course we had the incredible disruption of the past couple of years how did it feel for you to see the guide come together after everything in the at the awards well just i mean I'm, the first copy that you held in your hand or, or, or pressing the final send to send it off to the printers oh really nervous really nervous i i can't bear that final moment of sending it off. I, I just always think there's more I could have done, there's more I should have done, there's more checks I could have made, there's, gosh, there might be a, um, a, I don't know, a full stop where it shouldn't be or, you know, I just, I'm a perfectionist and I hate, I hate hitting the send button but when it's done and there's no more that you can do, I just have to let go of that process and, and um. It's actually quite sometimes a bit painful to get a copy of the guide in my hands. It's not a reward. It's like 
oh, I'm seeing things that I could have done better, should have done better. <laughs> I'll do better next time, that kind of thing. Um, but that aside, the, my own <clears throat> neuroses aside, sorry, I'm losing my voice from having been up late last night. <clears throat> um my own neuroses aside, I um, I found it incredibly rewarding just to see the joy of um, of the industry getting together and being together in a room for the first time. As I said, in three years, they hadn't had that opportunity, and this is it's one of the very few moments that the restaurant industry gets to be a guest of someone else, um, the good food guides. They are, they are our guests. They are um, drinking on our dime or our sponsor's dime. Thank you very much, sponsors. Um, and um, enjoying each other's company in a much more – I mean, I was going to say relaxed, but it's not exactly when their, their livelihoods or their um, – <laughs> what not is at stake, but in a slightly more convivial um, environment, and they get to chat and raise a glass with with um, their peers. It's a that is a reward in itself, really. Do you think? I mean, what do you think is the place of guides like this? Uh, given that there are so many other channels these days, do you, do you see a strong future for this sort of book? Um. Look, I don't – I would like to think so. I would like to think that there is a place for a curated list that even though – I mean, there's I, – I think it can be overwhelming um, as a – as a restaurant lover to decide where your next dollar is going to be spent if you're lucky enough to have the money to go and eat in restaurants. And I'm, I understand that not everyone does, but if that is something that you care to do, it's not always easy to find, you know, to decide where that dollar's going to be spent. And so I do think there is a role for a guide such as ours to um, help guide people towards that and give some sort of benchmark or some sort of uh, ranking, I suppose, to um, decide, ah, oh, yes, well, I've got it, – it, because there's so much information in this and you can see the restaurant side by side, you can say, oh, I need somewhere in the city. I want it to be informal or I want it to be more formal. And you can – from a smaller list, it can help inform your decision. So I'd, I would like to think that there is a future for it, but these these um, guides are not inexpensive to put together. There's hundreds of thousands of dollars invested in these meals because, as I said, the, the, the reviewers um, – do it anonymously, but they are paid for by Nine and by our sponsors. And um, that is a lot of money to invest in a product such as this. So for how long there is an appetite um, to for, for, for a guide such as this, I guess the sales will tell that story, won't they? The sales of the magazine will tell the story. If, if it sells well and it gets good feedback, well, you know, Let's keep it keeping on. I think there is an appetite in the industry, though, for um, something that, that has a kind of a benchmarking process. Yeah, very interesting. So people can head to theage.com.au or their local news agent, if they have one, uh, to purchase the guide. Uh, Ros, do you want to finish by highlighting a restaurant that you particularly loved reviewing this year? Oh, one of the ones that I really did love was a restaurant that few had heard of, I think, and it's, again, one of those regional places we were talking about before, a place called Moona in Konawara um, near Barwon Heads or uh, out on um, the Bellarine Peninsula. It's a, just a tiny little place. It used to be a wedding venue. Um, it's a small two like a what mainly a one roomed restaurant only seats twelve people. The chef has a kind of a bench in the middle of the room. He plates up the the dishes 
in the room, brings them to you, and you're sitting looking over a billabong, you know, ducks are alighting on the water. It's just a beautiful, beautiful experience. And he, the chef, um, Tobin Kent, has he goes out foraging. He goes and he grows a lot of the vegetables himself. He dives. So a lot of the, there's there's meaning in every ingredient um, he puts on a plate, and he he puts together dishes that are they look simple, but they there's a lot more complexity underneath them, and they are exceptionally delicious. And that was that's Moona, and it was just a beautiful experience, and that was one of the highlights for me this year. Oh, so good. And named Regional Restaurant of the Year. So with 14, no, 12 seats, that's going to be hard to get a booking. I haven't been there, but I'm going to try to um, snare a seat. Um, Rosalind, thank you so much for <laughs> taking the time to have a chat to us and explain the inner workings of the guide, especially after um, yeah, partying last night and celebrating its release. I really appreciate it. And congratulations on bringing this MOOC into the world. Thank you. Thanks for your interest, Danny. This is Dirty Linen and I'm Danny Vallant. We air the issues that the hospitality industry finds hard to talk about, hearing from different people with unique perspectives. We want to hear from you as well. If you have something that needs to be said about a topic, get in touch so we can include your perspective. Contact us at dirtylinen at deepintheweeds.com.au or hit us up on Insta at Dirty Linen Podcast. We can't wait to hear from you. This.